Okay, so what, uh, for the sake of time, uh, since we have a limited amount of time here, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Lauren Taylor. I am a third generation Oaklander, a product of the town, and I'm fortunate to represent District 6 on the Oakland City Council. I um, am just glad that we're able to be here today to have this conversation, one that has been uh, happening for a while, and I am grateful for the opportunity to help partner with my council colleagues, the city administration, members of the community, our business community, on really moving forward relative to contracting disparities that uh, we will hear have a disproportionate impact in the city of Oakland on Black-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. Um, a key to improving the condition in our communities is creating more economic opportunities, more um, pathways to financial independence for our community members. And that is one of the reasons why I, within District 6, within the council, have been focused on uh, really building up, strengthening, sustaining, and growing our, our diverse businesses, our Black-owned businesses, uh, to help move the Black community forward. We've been doing a number of things, uh, creating an East Oakland Entrepreneurship Initiative. We have been focused uh, with partners like the Black Cultural Zone, uh, Policy Link, and others on establishing a People of Color Small Business Network. And a critical part of creating that financial independence that addresses so many of the, the, the challenges that we face within our community is uh, using the city and its resources, its spend, in order to really move the needle by making sure that we're getting a proportionate amount of the investment into our community that we should. And so that is why we are here today, acknowledging the fact that we're not getting that proportionate share that we need to and should be getting it. And to really move from complaining about the issue and describing it to actually what are the tangible steps that we can take to move that forward. And so with that, um, I want to take the opportunity to allow my co-hosts and my fellow council members who are here today to provide some introductory remarks before we jump into the full program. Why don't we begin with uh, Dr. Eleanor Ramsey, who, will we hear, who we will hear from later, but just a quick introduction, uh, maybe a minute or so, and we'll then hear from Paul Cobb with the Post News Group and then Kathy Adams with the Oakland African American Chamber. Dr. Ramsey. Yes, good morning. And thank you very much, uh, Councilman Taylor, for convening this meeting and for your fellow council persons to participate. I'm looking forward to giving you my presentation on the findings from the study that we conducted for the city of Oakland. By way of introduction, though, for those of you who have not met, I have uh, been performing disparity studies now since 1990, uh, shortly months after the Supreme Court established a new standard in which you must document discrimination in order to have a program that provides remedies for minority businesses. And so we've been fortunate enough to work in 146 jurisdictions around the country, including places like New York City, New York State, Te State of Texas. And we've done two other studies for the city of Oakland. And so we have seen over the last uh, 20 some years, the pattern of disparity, which I'll discuss with you this morning. And thank you very much for being present. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Next, uh, Paul Cobb, if you're able to uh, unmute yourself and provide some intro remarks. Paul, are you there? While Paul is, uh, I guess, getting getting uh, connected, uh, let's go ahead and hear from Kathy, Kathy Adams. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning to everyone and welcome on behalf of myself, president of the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce, our board members and members of OAACC. 
Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce is our voice in the community. Today, it's about where we are going, how we will get there, how we will make it better for all Black and minority-owned business. It's about Oakland, the land in which we live. We will have the conversation, discussion, and how we build back staying focused on the future opportunities. We have been meeting monthly with the city of Oakland to advocate for you. It is a start, so let's do it together. I want to thank council member Lauren Taylor and all of his colleagues on the city council for the work that you do every day fighting for us. In the words of John Lewis, today is a day for good trouble and necessary trouble on how we look and forge ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kathy. And now I believe Paul should be able to uh, speak. We just made him a co-host. Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren, for uh, unmuting me uh, <laughs> on the question of money. Uh, many of us have been in despair about the disparity studies. And it must be the money because money creates jobs. It creates the opportunities. And we have to reverse the cash flow characteristics of where our money is going. It is going outside of Oakland and it is going to people who, have, who are not really our local taxpayers. And we have got to change the dynamics of the Oakland budget process. And we've got to start monitoring and revealing with a transparency approach where the dollars are going, who's getting it and who's not getting it. Not only in construction jobs and professional services, but in all types of work. And so I'm grateful that the Oakland Post can be a part of this town hall because we are going to pledge that we're gonna be a watchdog on the city council. We're gonna monitor you, Lauren, Rebecca, Treba, and the rest of the council. And you ought to be amenable to an audit on a weekly basis. We're gonna publish where the money is going. We're not gonna wait till the end of the year or for the city auditor to give us a report. We're going to publish with a grid and a dashboard format on a regular basis, who's getting the money and who's not. Thank you for this opportunity. We'll be watching you and we look forward to you and the rest of the council to show the kind of leadership to support the thrust that Dr. Eleanor Mason Ramsey and a lot of nonprofit and faith-based groups have fought to bring these changes about. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, and yes, absolutely. We are here to be held accountable because we are here working for you on your behalf, behalf of the community to make sure that we get this right. So um, it is a partnership and looking forward to that. Speaking of partnership, uh, I am fortunate to be uh, joined and in, in, in uh, working with my colleagues on the council. And I, a few of them are here today and I want to give them an opportunity to greet and say a few words. So first we'll hear from Vice Mayor Rebecca Kaplan. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who did the work to put this together. I think this is an incredibly important conversation and I appreciate the invitation uh, to say a few words, uh, both about the history and about what uh, needs to come next. Uh, as many of you may know, my name is Rebecca Kaplan. I'm honored to be your city council member at large and also the vice mayor for the city of Oakland. Uh, and in the previous budget, uh, I was the person who fought for the funding for Oakland to do the disparity study, uh, which was quite a fight and people uh, tried to resist it. And then after we won the money and won the study, uh, some people tried to prevent that study from being released. And so the work to continue to uplift the truth of what's been going on is incredibly important and it takes all of us uh, working together to uplift that commitment. And what the study does show is that the disparity is dramatic. The millions of dollars that are not going to black owned businesses because of inequitable contracting 
is a loss of millions of dollars of jobs and economic opportunity and is unacceptable. And both black owned businesses and women owned businesses were found to be underrepresented. The other thing that's found that I think is important is that a handful of well-connected favored businesses that are predominantly white male owned are getting the overwhelming majority of the contracts. And so that needs to be part of what we address going forward in terms of who has the connections or other things going on that is giving them favorable treatment. Uh, just a couple of other suggested topics as we delve into this incredibly important strategy. Um, one is to look at the issue of the harassment or overbilling of black owned businesses and black run events, uh, like what's been done uh, to Jeffries, uh, as well as Festival at the Lake, uh, where black owned businesses and black run events were targeted for overbilling uh, and harassment. I also think the question about where and how opportunities are advertised and noticed is an important part of the disparity. And I'm so glad we have Paul Cobb and the Post News Group as part of this because making sure that those opportunities are advertised to the community is essential uh, to getting it out as well as making it easier for businesses to get their permits, to get through the development process, to get through planning and building, that those bottlenecks and delays can disproportionately prevent uh, some of our black owned businesses and smaller businesses from getting through the process. And the last thing I would say is that providing equity has to actively happen. It, it, inequity doesn't only happen when people actively fight for inequity, Inequity happens when we don't actively fight for equity. And one thing I've been working on for the past couple of weeks, uh, together also with council member Treva Reed, who I believe is also on the line, is to fight for the opening of a COVID vaccination site at the Oakland Coliseum that would specifically provide outreach and reserve slots for our hardest hit and most left behind communities. And that when systems are used that prioritize those with the best computers and the most free time, that disproportionately benefits white people. And so we've been demanding that the state provide both outreach and vaccine appointment slots for our community in East Oakland and other hard hit areas. And so that can be a role model of what it means to truly uh, uplift an equitable approach. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today and uh, to continue this important work. Uh, thank you so much, good morning. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Kaplan. Uh, your, and I am appreciative for your partnership and your leadership on many of these critical issues. Next, we want to hear from uh, Council Member Treva Reed, who I believe has also uh, been given the uh, ability to unmute herself and hear a few words, hopefully keep it close to a minute uh, because we do wanna get into the heart of the program and also uh, hear from those on the line. Council Member Reed. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. I mean, we know that we've been underutilized, underpaid, unattached from entering, growing and sustaining our businesses which mean our families and communities um, for centuries. Not just the millions that we know were exposed through this study, but the opportunities that those projects um, and funding could have opened up for more opportunities. So this is an opportunity now for us to take increased action on advancing policies that ensure equity and inclusion for black and women owned businesses um, and development opportunities, investment, access to capital, um, and for us to not be shut out, um, even more for being underbanked um, with a lack of financial funding and getting a black owned bank back into the Bay Area. So I am excited to be a part of this, this season of breaking the cycles of just deep generational poverty and those disparities um, and disproportionate um, policies that we have allowed through the city that have impacted us and have devalued um, us as black and women owned businesses. And so we're here to address those wealth gaps. We're here to face and deal with the systemic racism that's affected us with generational wealth, pay equity, and just the loss of millions for financial security and keeping our families sustained from one generation to the next. So I look forward to deeping, uh, taking a deeper dive with you all today. Um, and even further beyond this, looking to see how my colleagues and I will keep working to advance our policies with that goal of ensuring equitable access to funds resources, training, RFP process and meeting notification, technical support, 
um, and those other areas that you will share more with us that uplift your businesses and that keep you at the table and helping us to track and be accountable and monitoring and ensuring our scope of work and how we even build the packages are developed to not shut you out, but to strengthen you, to protect you, to prioritize and to preserve our black and women owned businesses. So thank you for allowing me to participate with you. Thank you for that, uh, Councilmember Reed. I appreciate your uh, partnership as well and your uh, agreement to uh, step in and uh, join me as a co-author in the, the legislation that we're bringing forward. Um, with that, I uh, also want to acknowledge, has Councilmember Fife joined? I know she was intending to join and we wanna acknowledge uh, her. We have uh, Tanya Love on the line on behalf of Councilmember Fife. Great, if my team can make sure that uh, Ms. Love has uh, the ability to unmute herself and provide any remarks. Uh, that would be great. Ms. Love, let's see. Time Are you able to? Now. There you go. You are now yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Councilmember Taylor, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, Councilmember Fife is definitely interested in this topic. Um, she has been a long, cha long champion of making sure that disabilities report is published and shared with the community, in particular with this effort. Um, as you know that she's new, she asks a lot of questions. And so when lately when contracts have been put before the council, she's been, you know, kind of wanting to have a discussion about it and to understand how contracts were um, decided. Um, along with what council member Kaplan had mentioned, vice mayor Kaplan, she's also interested in making sure that contracts are adequately advertised, um, looking and also looking at the method for retaining and reviewing the contracts. Um, for example, she finds that the I supplier system has been a source of barriers for new partners, something that I have come across when working with grantees when I served on the Sugar Sweetened Beverage Advisory Board. So um, we're excited to see what comes from this conversation and we thank you for this opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Love, on behalf of uh, Council Member Fife. Um, definitely, it, it is incumbent on all of us to partner together, to work together, to move these uh, longstanding issues forward. And so I look forward to continued partnership, uh, not just with the current legislation that is on the table, but uh, that which we have telegraphed, which aligns with so many of the points that uh, folks have brought forward. Also critical to the partnership is how we as policymakers work with city administration, department staff. And so I wanna acknowledge that we've got uh, Jason Mitchell on the line, assistant city administrator, and who we will hear from a little bit later, as well as uh, Deb Barnes, who leads our Department of Workplace and Employment Standards, but within that, the Contracts and Compliance um, Office. Before we hear from them though, I, I would like to just jump straight in with Dr. Eleanor Ramsey uh, to provide an overview of the disparity study. After we hear from Dr. Ramsey, we will hear from the city administration relative to some immediate steps we can take to get connected to the city's contracting program, the local small local business program and other opportunities. We will review proposed legislation that's coming forward to the council um, that we believe will help move us in the right direction and set us up for even more impactful solutions uh, in the future. And then we want to preserve at least 30 minutes, if not more, for listening, because it's about hearing from you, those who are uh, impacted on the ground, working through the challenges around how we could and should move forward uh, and to, to really address the disparities that we've seen. So for now, I am going to stop my sharing and turn it over to Mason Tillman, Dr. Eleanor Ramsey, to provide the overview of the disparity study that she and her team uh, produced and that the council adopted and accepted in December. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman uh, Taylor. So the purpose of our study was to determine if minority and women businesses were underutilized in the award of the city's prime contracts and subcontracts during the period July 1, 2011 
to June 30th, 2016, which means we studied contracts awarded during that five-year period. And according to the court, if underutilized, it was our obligation to determine if the underutilization is due to chance or discrimination. And the, so the, study, the contracts that we studied fall into four industries, construction, professional services, and as Paul has noted, we study goods and commodities, which is the full range of items, equipment, materials that the city buys from catering food to uh, large machines, all of which fall within the domain of this study and services, services that were not professional services in nature, could be computer installation, could be uh, delivery of uh, various products. So, Everything that a local government needs, which is virtually all that's available in its community, was in our study. And that's very important that it is not just construction or professional services. We also study each of the ethnic groups, uh, and that included African Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, Asian Indian Americans, two groups that were so divided, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Caucasian females, and what we call non-minority males, which are white uh, men and other in, uh, for, um, uh, private uh, partnerships and other relationships, business relationships that are not owned by uh, a person of color or a woman. There's a legal standard that guided this work, and it's very important for me to call your attention to two pieces of um, that arena that very important as we went, for, went forward in doing our study. One, we have a 14th Amendment of the US Constitution, which says that there cannot be discrimination based on race. That is a guiding principle for this work. But also in the state of California, as a result of the passage of Proposition uh, 209, almost 20 years ago, there is an Article 1, Section 31 of the California Constitution which says there can be no preference given to businesses in the award of contracts, education, or um, employment. So we then, in our analysis, look to see if there was evidence of preference as well as in, in the analysis of determining if there was discrimination, which would have been under utilization of any of the groups uh, that was not due to chance. There were three studies that have been done for the city of Oakland since the passage of the issuing of the Croson decision in 1989. And Mason Tillman has had the good fortune of doing all three. I might note the pattern of discrimination that we have documented in this most recent study is evident and was evident in the previous two studies. So there's been almost 25 years of documented disparity in the use of um, businesses owned by people of color and one consistent pattern is discrimination against African Americans. And I will at the end share with you some highlights, which I think you might want to do some reading aside from reading the tome that we submitted that will illustrate how this discrimination has manifested itself in housing and education and has earned open the distinction of being the city with the most segregated neighborhoods in the San Francisco Bay Area. So the, as Lauren has indicated, this a draft was submitted and the city council accepted that draft on the 20th of, uh, on a December, in December, 2020. So let's begin by looking at what is most important to those businesses present this morning. And that would be the total prime contract dollars, MWBEs lost. They lost those dollars as a result of non-minority males receiving more dollars than due to that group based on their availability in the city of Oakland. Important to keep in mind as we talk this morning, when we talk about a disparity, it is really a standard that the court has established where you first define the businesses and identify and enumerate businesses available in your market area. And for this analysis, that area was the city of Oakland. And then you seek to determine if those, if businesses in the market area received contracts at the same level that they were present in the market area. So as you can see from this depiction of the study years that we studied, 
The city awarded during that five year period almost a, a little over a half a billion dollars to businesses as prime contractors. Now those prime contractors hired subcontractors, but the prime contractor had control over the monies that the city funded, uh, used to fund their contracts. So it's a very important perspective to know the role and place of a prime contractor in public contracting. And so the dollars expected for non-minority males was 73%. They actually received 80.12%. So they received $58 million more than they should have received based on their availability. And thus those dollars were lost by one or several of the ethnic groups that should have received dollars equal to their availability. They did not because white males received more dollars than they should have received based on their availability. And so you can see in this, uh, this um, illustration what the dollars are that were lost. So let's look then at the subcontract dollars that were lost. And so with, we have in the subcontracting, you have a similar pattern where the uh, Caucasian um, males or non-minority males as they're described in this uh, study received more dollars than they should have received. They in turn uh, as subcontractors and you can see that ethnic groups that lost dollars as a result of the dollars not being awarded equitably based on the availability of each of the groups. And that sets the stage for what we need to talk about when we think about the size of the contracts. It is often said by those who feel that these um, studies and the remedies that the studies offer are not based on a real need because they would argue that the businesses could not do the work that the government awarded and consequently it would not be reasonable or feasible to have a program that attempts to address that. And I want to call your attention when we look at all of the contracts that were awarded by the city during that five year period, over 90% of those contracts were less than $250,000. I often say when you start looking at smaller contracts that a construction contract in particular can prepare his bid in the cab of his car on a coffee covered napkin if the contract is small enough. And so what you see from this depiction is that over 70% of the contracts were less than $25,000. It is also important to know, and we'll talk about that in a minute, as we look at the highly used contractors, it's important to know contracts under $50,000 do not require public advertising. Therefore, managers are in a position where they can make decisions about who they reach out to to select for contracts under $50,000. There's a lot of power that's vested in managers, and this is not unique to Oakland. It's part of our procurement process nationally, and the levels that, uh, of authority given to managers varies depending on jurisdictions, but in this City of Oakland, it's $50,000. And so it is in the hiring or awarding of contracts under $50,000 that you see evidence of a preference because the manager can make the choice uh, of who he or she awards that contract that's under 50,000. So when we look at all industries, uh, you can see the uh, contract size. Uh, and so let's go forward and um, look at highly used contractors. And here it's important, and I think that uh, Councilwoman Reed made reference to this, is that there's a lot of control that's vested in a very few contractors. And you see here with construction prime contracts, when we look at cont dollars, because dollars are really in the important decide. Um, the important area because it decides who gets to be a subcontractor and it also decides where your money is distributed, what communities receive those uh, benefits because a business owner makes decisions about employees and the determination of where who the employee is will determine whether the money gets reinfused in a given neighborhood 
a given city or someplace outside of the jurisdiction's boundaries. So looking at prime contractors, effectively who has control. So what we see under construction, there were eight businesses out of a total of 91 that received a construction prime contract. And eight businesses received 71% of the dollars spent on construction prime contracts. And so eight businesses had control over the decisions about who received the subcontract. We go forward and look at the professional service industry. Here you had more vendors uh, that were used, but you had uh, 439 vendors. Here, 45 vendors were controlled 70% of the dollars. And this um, practice is evident in service. As I indicated, we did look at service contracts, non where technical requirements were not a condition of the classification as a service contract. And here you had, again, many more contractors. However, you had 20 of them that received 70% of the dollars. This pattern is evident also in goods and commodities, which would include things like the um, catering, pencils, paper, whatever might be necessary to run the, the, the uh, government. And so while there, was, oh, there were over a thousand companies that received one or more contracts, 45 of them received 70% of the dollars. And so this, I think, should dramatize the impact of the way decisions are made. And the decisions made are systemic, they're not by chance. They are due to a series of policies and practices. So looking at the disparity, which is the court's way of determining whether there is underutilization of any given group and whether that underutilization is significant at a level that it did not occur by chance that it occurred by what the Supreme Court would call discrimination. And if you look at the last column here, it would indicate that you have, um, where you have a disparity would be a, a 0 0.05, a carrot 0 0.05 indicates where there is a disparity. And just to explain what we're looking at, because we'll depict this at different levels of spend as well as different industries, you show here the actual dollars that were received by the group, the percent that they were utilized to account for those dollars. So here, $237,000 were received by African-Americans. The availability of African-American construction companies to do prime contracts, recognizing that uh, over 90% of your prime contracts are relatively small, was 16% uh, of the entire pool of prime construction contractors that we identified, and that the expected dollars is greater than the actual dollars. And so there were $359,000, basically $360,000 that were lost to African-American construction prime contractors. As I noted earlier, the African-Americans in every industry have had a disparity consistently. Other groups have had it in some, but African Americans have had it in all. So let's go, and this is now small contracts under 50,000 where the managers can call businesses and solicit bids or services from them. Again, where the preference is exhibited in the outcome of these decisions. Professional services, again, the same depiction where you had a utilization of 4.18, but you had an availability of 9%. So 9% of all of the businesses that we identified in the city of Oakland that were willing and able to do the city's contracts under $50,000 were uh, represented 9% of the pool and they received 4% of the dollars. And if we fast forward, we see services, you see a similar pattern. You have even greater availability to perform those services that do not require technical certification and, and training. But the utilization now is at 2.9%. Again, those contracts that were awarded 
without having to be advertised. So uh, commodities, goods and commodities, the pattern is the same. You have different ethnic groups that uh, participate in this and you note also the um, symbols for the non-minority males in each of these slides where they are overutilized. Uh, but we're not studying overutilization. The courts have made that question very narrow. The question is, are minorities utilized in parity with their availability? And if not, is there underutilization? And thus, if so, is it statistically significant? And that's the issue. Because of the concern in the case law for the, the factor called uh, ABLE in the Supreme Court's decision, there have been a number of cases since Colson was decided on the 23rd of January, 1989, that raised the question of what does it mean to say a business is willing and able. And we have some time ago determined that it was important to address the issue of able so that our studies would not be subject to an attack that we were counting businesses that did not have the capacity to perform the work. And noting under the, when looking at the under 50,000, there should be no debate about ability. But when looking at larger contracts, what we have done is to establish a cap on the size of contracts. And we do that using some statistical formulas. And in this instance, for construction, we were analyzing contracts from 50,000 to 780,000. And once again, African-Americans were, uh, had a disparity. So let's go forward and you see this pattern uh, in the other services here. We're looking at professional services, which would include design services, architects, engineers, researchers, and others where a license and technical training is required. And here the cap was at 310,000. And uh, there, there was a disparity. And then goods and commodities, the cap was set at 190, again, based on uh, removing what we call the um, outliers or extraordinarily large contracts. So we were able to ensure that the contracts being studied were contracts where our pool of businesses had the capacity to perform the work. So when you move from prime contracts to subcontracts, for those of you who are not in the professional service or construction business, you might not be mindful of the fact that many decisions made to, in performing work for in the construction arena is done by using subconsultants, subcontractors. It is the case in many industries in the construction world that roughly 70 to 80% of the dollars spent on a construction contract are spent with subcontractors. So that is a significant source of business for businesses in the trades that are doing various um, services like electrical, plumbing, air conditioning, roofing. There are a lot of services that are provided, whether it's on a road project or on a building project. So this is very significant area of work for the construction businesses. And again, you can see with African-Americans that the Availability was 17, roughly 18% of all of the businesses in this pool of businesses based in Oakland that were willing and able to do the city's work. And African Americans received less than 2% of the dollars. Asian Pacifics also, but uh, focusing on this one group that is consistently underutilized. Professional services are different perspective here because all of the work that we did in the effort to try to reconstruct the subcontracts, I might note that while the city has done a tremendous job of trying to record and requiring, there are many policies in place requiring prime contractors to list their subcontractors, compliance by the prime contractors and the managers of those prime contracts has not resulted in systematic compilation and collection of the subcontract records. So this study, we spent many hours and many dollars trying to reconstruct the subcontracts that had in fact been awarded by the primes. And so in professional services, we simply were not able to collect enough to be able to 
test the underutilization. But I think you can see for African Americans, the underutilization is quite apparent that 9% of the pool of uh, professional service subcontractors were African Americans and they received le uh, less than 4%. So the city, as you know, has a local, small local uh, business program. It has operated now for since the mid 90s, a very aggressive, rigorous local business program. And to say the least, that program has not been efficacious. It just has not been able to ensure that African Americans received contracts as a local, small local business equal to their availability. So African Americans have endured the process of certifying. And for those of you who have done certification, it doesn't really matter. It's always trying to be invasive and pursue information that you'd like to hold private, but you must release it in order to be certified. And so in the pool of certified businesses, during the study period, almost 17% were African-American. African-Americans received nine contracts and they received less than 1% of the dollars spent with local, small, local business enterprises. So the program, although Progressive, aggressive, failed the African-American community. So key findings for the non-minority male preference program. As I noted when I began that the state as a, uh, the state constitution as a result of the passage of 209 has article one, Section 31, which said that preference cannot be afforded to businesses in the award of contracting. The intent of Proposition 209 was to end uh, affirmative action programs for people of color. And it effectively did that by codifying it in the state constitution. But we believe that this provision that says you cannot give a preference is to be applied to any group. No group should have a preference per the state constitution. And as I've indicated in our analysis of the informal contracts, those under 50,000 that you have seen where the managers in the city of Oakland have the authority to make a selection of a vendor without having to advertise publicly and distribute it widely, that they have made the selection of white males over people of color and specifically over African-Americans. That we believe is evidence of a preference. The two other programs that the city employs, which we believe is further evidence of a preference, and one is a rather interesting one that's called in the city of Oakland on-call contracts. It's called variously in other communities, but it's a process by which an advertisement is placed for vendors. And in the city of Oakland, they're doing it for professional services. They do it for construction, and they also do it for goods and services. But in, as it applies to the public works on the professional, on the architectural and engineering side and construction, the process affords the manager uh, a, a way of using a procurement method where they advertise uh, on-call contracts, which are multi-year contracts. And they are contracts with sometimes a specified maximum, but it's not for a particular project. It is a process of procurement method that allows for the managers to bench a, a group of contractors, a, a group of construction contractors and a group of design, architectural, and engineering contracts. And they then are awarded a on-call contract. They are put on a list. And what is significant about this process is that the managers can go into that list and select from that list any vendor that it wishes to make an assignment. The po policy that gave this authority to Public Works said that those contracts were not to exceed 
25,000 when assigned to a company that's on the bench or on this on-call list. Our research showed that the level of spend with companies on that list far exceeded the 25,000. And again, this is a institutional practice uh, that is inconsistent with the policy, which says it should not exceed no one request for a project assigned to a vendor on the pre-call list should exceed 25,000. The fact they did. And so you can see significant dollars, $26 million have been, were spent during this five-year period with businesses that were on this list uh, on call list and were pulled from this list to receive a project and many received many projects except African-Americans. And so African-Americans received 3.93% of the dollars that were awarded for construction on call. There were 23 vendors on that list, four of them were African-Americans, effectively 17% of the pool they got 3.93% of the dollars that were expended at the discretion of the managers within public works. Again, preference being afforded to the non-minority males who received 67% of the dollars for on-call contracts. So on-call is one. There's another practice that, uh, and you can see uh, from this slide, the number of contracts that were received uh, by dollars. And then you, we applied, we had sufficient records to be able to test the underutilization statistically. And so we have a disparity. Some groups have underutilization. It's notable with the um, Asian um, Indians, while they had no dollars, their availability was so low that the test could not discern that. And that's true with Native Americans and, uh, and Alaskan Natives, but they were underutilized because they received absolutely no uh, zero dollars. But you can see here that this underutilization that we identified when tested showed that it was due to discrimination. So going forward um, to look at it by uh, the second method or third method that we think is indication of preference, one again being the informal contracts under 50,000, the on-call contracts we've just discussed. And then there's a third procurement method, again, fairly widely used in this country um, in the procurement business. And this is what's called cooperative agreements. And this is probably one of the best kept secrets in the procurement business. Because in this instance, what is allowed is for a government, in this case, the city of Oakland, can go to New York City. And if there is a company that's doing business in New York City, and they are going, they're doing business that the city of Oakland would like to retain services equal to or comparable to what's being done on their contract in New York City. If the method of procurement is a competitive one in which the city of New York advertised its contract, then the city of Oakland can say to the city of New York that we want to use your contract. Is that permissible? And the standard and many, even in the procurement codes, it says that if another city wants to use your contract, you should, or another governmental entity, you should in fact honor that request. And then once that's agreed to, then they go to the vendor who has often marketed its services to the city of Oakland to say, I have a contract with the city of New York. I see that you're going to be doing sidewalk cutouts uh, and I want that contract. And I have one with the city of New York, would you use that? And once that arrangement is made, then the contract that was um, the vendor had with the city of New York is the contract instrument used by the city of Oakland to engage that contractor. And that goes through across the industries. And so what you see in this instance that African-Americans were only on seven occasions given a cooperative agreement contract that was negotiated with another entity and used by the city of Oakland. Again, this is pure preference 
because there are no limits to what contracts you can use, what vendors you select, and you can, in fact, it can result in the output that you see here. It is also notable that of the seven contracts that African Americans received through a cooperative agreement because they had a contract with another entity, six of them were under 50,000. So they not only got few, but the few they got was small. So that's third example of preference as it has been applied. So go forward to our Thank recommendations. You. Dr. Ramsey, thanks. Thanks so much for running through this. Uh, in light of time, uh, maybe if you can take a maybe a couple minutes to just close out the recommendations, and then I'm sure that we're going to have Q and A's that get a little deeper into uh, understanding this. In Thank addition you. to how we move forward, and everything that's being stated and being recommended is in the report. So in short. We are recommending based on the pre presence of a preference being given over the five years that we studied that the city put in place race-based remedies, which would be both discounts for construction bids, as well as evaluation points for professional services, and that there would also be subcontract remedies that could be up to the level of availability. So that's on the race conscious side and recognizing that um, the Article 1, Section 31 says you cannot afford a preference, and we think there is evidence of that. And then there are a number of other recommendations which are in the report in great detail that are intended to maximize the participation with open businesses and to bring about more equity in so doing. And I'd like to close with suggesting some readings for you that are, I have found to be informative. And one of the most stellar of those is the 2000, the 2018 Open Equity Indicators Report that was done by the director of the Race and Equity Partner uh, Program, Mrs. Uh, Flynn. But what she has found in a very honest and direct an evaluation of Open, that there's a gulf between people of color and Caucasians and six themes that were analyzed, including contracting, and the sponsor and partner of this, which is City University of New York, has given Oakland a score of 33.5 out of 100%, which means that our racial equity is less than what it should be. And there's a more recent study that was done by the University of California that has given Oakland rank amongst the most segregated cities in the San Francisco Bay Area. and most racially segregated neighborhoods. So we think that it is certainly behooves the city to look very seriously at this work and recognize that it is not, it, while it is a study of last five years, it is evidence of a pattern that has existed now for the last uh, two decades. And it is not an occurrence that has been, was a fluke for the years in study. And again, I thank you for this opportunity and the opportunity to have been able to conduct this study for the residents of the city of Oakland. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Um, I know that uh, if everyone was unmuted, there would be a huge round of applause. Um, so it is absolutely critical, the work that you have done. I see the silent uh, sort of clap. So huge appreciation because the work that you've done is so critically needed to unfortunately relay to us those things that we already know mm -hmm. um but it's the data and the facts and the uh irrefutable sort of structure that you and your team have brought to conducting this study that will enable us to move towards the recommendations that you're providing which are that we go to uh race based race conscious uh implementation to really repair the harms that we have seen and the disparity that exists. Um, that being said, I do want to just acknowledge that there are a spectrum of sort of improvements and recommendations. Uh, I think the race conscious ones are the ones that we know will have the biggest impact, the deepest impact. And those are ones that I believe my colleagues 
share uh, and many within the city share in terms of a uh, uh, desire to move towards that to address the harms for both black owned businesses, women owned businesses and others. Um, in that uh, sort of uh, just to acknowledge and I know we've been in conversation is that there are a number of steps and processes on the legal side preparation etc that are needed to get to race conscious recommendations and implementing those and we are working towards that in the uh, interim we have some uh, direct improvements and enhancements that we are working through uh, that are race neutral what, what uh, I believe reflect some of the uh, sort of minor recommendations that you had in the uh, report but also what many of our contractors suppliers vendors have been calling for with the overall program improvements and so we will talk about some of those uh, later as well. Before doing so, I know next in our agenda, we wanted to give the city administration a chance to just provide an overview of ways to plug in for our, um, our uh, folks to plug in. After uh, that, we'll quickly go through our the, the resolutions that are coming forward and then get our Q&A. Right now it's 11.04. Um, and city administrator Jason Mitchell, are you on the line? Or is there is Deb Barnes available to speak? Um, Council member Jason is um, on the line. Okay. Just, Have we made him a co host so he can? Uh, there he is. Hi, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't. I couldn't unmute um, uh, first. So, so thank you, uh, Council Member Taylor, for giving me an opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ramsey, thank you for giving giving this group uh, 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 definitely an overview on where we're at with our city contracts, and we're not in a good spot. I, I, I think everyone on this call knows that uh, the city of Oakland, over the last few decades, haven't done a good job at ensuring that everyone is participating in our contracting process. And that data, um, we all knew it in our heart and spirit, but now we have data to, to back it uh, through the great work of doc, Dr. Ramsey. Um, and so me and my new role as an assistant city manager, um, and I, I know we had a PowerPoint presentation um, and I'll be very brief because I know time is limited. Um, it's, it's really to figure out how do we engage better um, with you and, 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 and the folks that are not here so that we can um, celebrate better numbers um, in the future um, regarding the disparities in Oakland. You know, my father owning a construction company and my wife is a small business owner. I do know the frustration not being able to do business in, in a town that you were you know, born and raised and, and, and live in. And so um, understanding that um, we really want to reach out to you, especially from the administration side, and that's representative Debbie Barnes, who's on here, that's over our contract and compliance division, who's been doing this work with uh, Dr. Ramsey for, for over a, a few years to get the data, but also our Department of Transportation, our Public Works Department, our Finance Department um, uh, to be engaged in it. And so one of the things that we wanted to do first is, is, is as you see, there's a survey, you have the survey probably in the link as well. And it was uh, as, as it was an invite to this. We, we don't want to pretend that we understand what's going on and the reason why. So we really would like for you all to fill out that survey. Uh, we haven't gotten it right. And so how do we get it right by being better listeners and listening to you and understanding how do we get, get better and, and to uh, make sure that contracts are getting out. Another point, and, and, and we heard from um, Dr. Ramsey, that our I supplier, that's where you register your business and you're able to get our PRQs. Um, um, this is a link that you see here, but I, we know that um, there's some challenges around that. Um, and so with that, we're, 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 we're looking to do a lot of work led by council member Taylor, uh, Kathy Adams with the chamber, many small businesses, um, uh, uh, council member Reed and the city administration team to include Debbie Barnes is really looking to, to, to share with that, that small group support contracting opportunities committee, uh, how our construction contract process works, how our professional development um, contracts work and how all of our com commodities work in the city of Oakland. 
you know, giving that full comprehensive process so that we can dissect it and from an administrative side, figure out how we ensure more inclusivity into that process, whether that's by more training, um, whether that's by better advertising, whether that's by different ways in, in which we score and rank things, um, really looking at ways so that we can have better outcomes. And so this committee, we're committed to that. We have our finance team that does all of our commodities. We have Debbie Barnes that does our professional services. And we have DOT and Public Works that does a majority of our construction contracts. Um, so all of our key stakeholders at that executive level is going to be there. The decision makers will be there so that we can move things forward. We also are committed to Council Member Taylor, and he will talk about a local and small local business enterprise program that he's pushing through our legislative process. But we have committed to Council Member Taylor not only to support him in, 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 in bringing that forward and being a subject matter expert, but also committing that we will execute as fast as possible uh, the things that come out of those resolutions and ordinances. <clears throat> um, and, and in a second, and then I, I, I briefly mentioned it, is really how do we get more participation in RFPQ process? How do we let folks know the things that are coming down the pipeline better? How do we be more transparent to Mr. Paul Cobb uh, said earlier in the process? Those are some of the things that number one, that, I, that we need to be held accountable to, but also figure out how we do better. And so I, I just want to, to reach out and I know my time is shorter um, because of, uh, um, we're running late. We want to get through some Q and A and into the small business enterprise program. But I want to let you, everyone, know here is that our city administration is committed to this process. We're committed to um, breaking those barriers, and we're committed to ensuring that more folks get it. It's not lip service. We're not looking to have a committee that sits for six months or a year and we have the same outcomes. We have a committee that's sitting down and want to do some real fast sprints so that we can have quicker outcomes because people cannot wait long, long. They need these contracts to keep their business afloat, especially during these times. We have, understand that. And so our, 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 we are committed to not only giving our time, but also giving a lot of energy and internally to figure out how we do things better. So I just want to thank the council member. I want to thank our, our esteemed committee, Dr. Ramsey, um, Mr. Paul Cobb, um, uh, uh, Kathy Adams, who's pushing me every day, and Councilmember Kaplan, Fife and Reed for being a big support. So I just want to thank you all for, for giving us this opportunity and know that our, your city administration team and, and all the departments that are represented under it um, is here to figure out how we get, get this going from a, from a programming standpoint and really working with our policyholders to figure out how we create policies that that release some of those barriers going forward. So I just want to thank you for your time. Um, I hope you're having a great Saturday and I'm looking for some quick, quick outcomes and wins. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, even though we have limited time, uh, Deb Barnes, our, our, our leader of the Contracts Compliance Group, I know you said your main goal was to hear the questions and provide support there. Anything you want to share before we uh, move on to the next part? Oh, oh no, thank you for the opportunity. But I, I think Jason said it all, just ready to, you know, roll up our sleeves and, and make quick changes um, and just um, kind of feeling very positive about the, the potential. So Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that, Deb, and all the work that you are doing uh, uh, on behalf of our city and the businesses, our diverse businesses. So gonna very quickly just walk through there are two pieces of legislation that I wanted to share, make sure everyone's aware of. One is a resolution that we passed on January 12th, and it is in direct response to, both are in direct response to the disparity study and the attempt to move forward on the, um, on the recommendations from, from it. Uh, so a resolution passed on January 12th, it really is directing the city administrator to come back in short order uh, to give us a plan, feasibility assessment and plan on how we implement uh, these items that you see listed here, one through six. The first is looking at uh, the uh, possibility of an owner controlled insurance program, either operating independently or in partnership with the Port of Oakland. This is intended to address the barrier of our small businesses uh, having 
the critical insurance that's needed, uh, that's a requirement to bid on projects and be a prime contractor. And so there are ways that we can lower that barrier. The second is um, <clears throat> focusing on what Dr. Ramsey mentioned, the on-call contracts and cooperative agreements, ways that uh, we sometimes get past the local small local business requirements, get past the focus on making sure that our diverse businesses get access. And so um, looking at how we increase the participation of the, our target businesses there, recommendations and tangible ways to, to move forward. And some of that that's been addressed uh, are having carve outs for our small local businesses um, that ensure that a certain percentage of the contracts go towards them. Other ways of allocating these funds, these projects, opportunities and distributing them. Third is around the uh, professional services program. A lot of time there's talk about construction and uh, professional services that relate to construction, but not more broadly professional services and or procurement um, opportunities. And so we wanna make sure that we're expanding the focus of our, our, our efforts broadly across all of our spend categories. We wanna also make sure that our small, and number four addresses what I was uh, talking about, the set aside program, how we can implement a set aside program for our small local diverse businesses. Fifth is establishing a bonding and finance program, a contractor uh, development program. We've got our, um, I believe that we have uh, Meriwether and Williams, a local black woman owned insurance business on the line and they have uh, been instrumental in setting up contractor development programs to really support with bonding financing uh, in Alameda County in San Francisco. And we want to make sure that we're using those best practices, applying that to Oakland opportunities and Oakland businesses and entrepreneurs. And the last one, and this uh, came from one of our business owners was, what if we create a credit incentive program for any procurement, construction or professional services contracts to entrepreneurs who graduated from an Oakland high school. The fact that we need to be able to make a promise to our Oakland, uh, our Oakland youth that as they, uh, you know, graduate, as they create businesses, can we establish a, a special incentive that says similar to the Oakland promise that, uh, you know, uh, is, is being touted around higher education, we should be able to promise to our kids that if they build a business in Oakland, they get competitive advantage for contracting opportunities in Oakland. So those are some of the, those are included in the resolution that's passed. We expect to hear back from administration in the next uh, couple few months. The other one is that we have an ordinance coming this Tuesday. And that ordinance isn't, is, is about immediate things that we can do to change our small local business program to make it more uh, competitive for our local businesses, our diverse businesses, and particularly our black businesses. And so things included here are reducing the size standard so that our small businesses don't have to compete with larger businesses. So it's a small, you have to qualify to be a small business. There's a lower revenue threshold. Also on the table is if redefining what it means to be an Oakland based business, instead of simply purchasing or leasing a, uh, an office and having one employee, we wanna have a higher requirement. So what we're saying is you have to have at least 20% of your employees based in Oakland for you to be able to qualify for a small business. That way these non-Oakland businesses don't just qualify by some paperwork, uh, a simple um, uh, a process, but we really raise that bar, that standard. Also, we're looking at aspects of increasing bid preference points to our very small local businesses, those who make less than $250,000 in revenue. We want to increase the incentives for those who participate in a mentor protege program where a large business supports a smaller business and really mentors them so that they grow because we really need to grow our, our black businesses, our women owned businesses uh, to the scale that they need to be. And then there are some other uh, improvements here as well. Wanted to walk through that just so that everyone knew some of the things that are currently on the table um, at, in response to the disparity study and the comments from uh, various minority uh, contractors and uh, women owned uh, businesses as well. There, I think we ran through that. Now I wanna get to uh, the Q&A because I know that there are a lot of questions that were coming in the chat as well as um, hands that are raised. And so for the sake of time, I want to 
identify those, uh, maybe the first couple hands that are raised while the team tees up some of the questions that came through in the chat. Um, so let's see who's first in the queue. I see Doug first in the queue. Doug, we're going to give you an opportunity to unmute and uh, go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. And if you could keep it um, concise, since we have uh, a lot of folks with questions. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Council Member uh, Taylor. Thank you for uh, uh, being a part of this wonderful uh, eye opening disparity. And uh, the other members who are participating, uh, President and CEO of Oklahoma African American Chamber of Commerce, Kathy Adam, uh, Paul Cobbs uh, with the Post, and also Dr. Uh, Eleanor Ramsey. But I'll make my question and statement brief. I have been a part and have fought since then to make sure that on these federal and uh, local government contracts, that the politicians play a huge role in that, making sure that there's equitable, equitable opportunity for minority business, black uh, and black woman owned businesses. To that end, uh, I was just with the Oakland East Bay Democratic Club appointed uh, by the president and the uh, vice president to work to highlight those politicians who are doing a lot of lip service. So I'm just letting people know this is this is the notice going out. If you're not promoting black businesses in Oakland and Alameda County, you will be displayed on a list uh, so that your constituents know where you stand. Thank you. Thank you for that, Doug. Um, and yes, encourage everyone to make sure that we are being held accountable. We're keeping us honest as well as other uh, stakeholders as well. Next in the queue, we've got Mario Wagner. Mario, I'm going to ask you to uh, unmute. Mario, you should oh. be able to speak now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the participants in making this event happen today. Uh, it's uh, been a challenging time, especially trying to do business with the city. Um, uh, the best thing that we could do uh, is come together and understand that there's something that has to change. Um, we can do surveys, but the reality of it is uh, the survey has already been done with the disparity study. We could give recommendations. We could spend countless hours like we've done in the past trying to put things together. But until we can actually get to a point where we're able to get work done, it really won't make a difference. So I'd like to thank everybody involved and continue to fight and uh, stay to the cause. Thank you. Hey, Lauren, this is Paul Cobb. I, I thought I was at raising my hand from the very beginning, but I'm going to be brief. Since so many people have been texting me on my private uh, cell phone here, wanting my contact information, I was wondering if you could let them know that I have uh, struck a, a partnership arrangement with the uh, Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce and any Black business or contractor or nonprofit organization that is trying to get a contract with the city and is having difficulty. And if you need to tell your story, if you go through the post or through the African American Chamber of Commerce, we will give you space in the paper for free and we will promote and we will put the photograph of the city administrator who's blocking and who is not responding. And we will, and so my phone, my uh, uh, email address is goodnewspc at aol.com. Or you can send stuff to the www.postnewsgroup.com, either one of them, or to the African American Chamber of Commerce. And we will proudly, on a weekly basis, let the world know whether or not you have been treated fairly and whether or not you're getting your fair share. We, want, we will act as the money grand jury investigating wh where the money is going. And we expect you, Lauren Taylor, Rebecca, uh, Carol, and uh, Treva to encourage the city administrators 
to put our money where their mouth is. They say that they want to uh, let us know what is happening. We demand that you demand that they reopen the books and let us know so we can take a look at where the money is going and who's getting their fair share. Thank you very much for the time on that. Thank you for that, Paul. Thank you for your commitment to making sure that there is full transparency, open transparency and accountability for our, our, our local government, for us. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say that for us doing this, we are being penalized and the city is not giving us our fair share of advertising, even though Measure R was passed with 73% under the leadership of, of Rebecca Kaplan and others, uh, the voters voted for the black press to get their fair share. But as the mayor said, they don't want us putting the word out. Uh, so they are penalizing us for blowing the whistle. But that's all right. We're going to blow the whistle on that. And hey, now thank, that we, thank you, Paul. Thank you, right. Paul. I, I, I know I speak for not only myself, but uh, the other council members on the line that we are committed to making sure that uh, our, our black businesses get their share, including our news media. So uh, absolutely. And thank you for that. Next in the queue, we're going to go to Ryan Gazinski on the line. Ryan. Uh, let's see. Let me. I'm asking you to unmute now. You should be able to speak. You hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody, of course, for being on the line. LT, just want to give a big shout out, especially all the work that we've been doing at the Black Cultural Zone in the Acoma Market recently in the last six months. Um, Double OG, the organization that I'm with, we are working on a program out there that I think that kind of falls into this, especially with the construction effort, uh, the liberation uh, pedagogy, and the job development programming. The big thing that LT hit on, I'm glad he said, was the youth. We are a firm believer in where is the youth in participating in this whole collaboration of considering what we're doing going forward in the future. I think uh, Mr. Mitchell had a lot of great points there as far as where are we at with plugging in all of our high school youth to be active participants in planning the future going forward. I don't know of any youth that are under 20 that are actually on this call. So that says a lot to me, excuse me. Um, I just wanna make sure that they're participating in our future too, right? Uh, a couple other things I wanted to say was, uh, Pam, you had made a little comment about emailing the city council. Is there a specific coalition or group that is heading up these efforts as far as a town hall or what um, LT, I imagine a lot of stuff is going to be running through you. Um, so just wanted to say, you know, we're getting down, we're getting dirty, and uh, looking forward to continuing to making change grow in East Oakland all the time at the Black Culture Zone and Como Market. We hope to see y'all out there too uh, tomorrow. That's it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ryan, uh, the question is how you can get more involved or ask questions. I did see the District 6 um, email address in the link. The email to email all council members is council, C O U N C I L, at oaklandca.gov. That's how you can uh, make sure that the full council hears what you have to say. Um, I'm going to turn to my team. Are there any questions that you want to lift up from the chat that uh, we we may want to have folks address from the um, panel? There's a, a Mr. Stanley Cooper wanted to make a comment and had a question. He's All right. Uh, is, it, is it something you want to read out or is Stanley... Uh, I, would like to, I don't have the question. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm asking Stanley to unmute. Stanley, you there? Uh, yes, I am. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I want to take this time out to thank the forum uh, this morning. Now, everyone who spoke is important, and those who are just listening is important. So just thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to... to um, Home in, home in on what's going on, uh, like myself and uh, Mario Wagner and a lot of others, you know, who's, who's kind of been in this uh, in the beginning. Um, I just want to make sure that, for example, um, when we do start to um, figure out, you know, unravel this and, and start to figure out, you know, how, how we can level the playing field, I just want to make sure that um, 
not only just the locals, like, you know, uh, graduate from high school as an owner. That was one of the things I, I threw out there. So thank you, Lauren, for, for um, speaking on that today. What I think is important is that, yes, let the future know, let the students know, um, like Ryan was saying, um, the kids, it's important that once we, once they graduate, they, they know they can make money at home. It's cool, to, it's cool to venture out of other places, but you gotta be successful in your own backyard. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of the main things, you know? Mm -hmm. And another thing is when these outside companies that came out here and like the statistics blew my mind again, this morning, how less than one percent of the small local business is getting these contracts. It that all that tedious paperwork that I went through, that we all went through, is failing us. It's failing us big time. Mm. And so, what I don't want to see is that going forward, that when when I don't want to see that these, let me call it what it is, these white-owned contractors, these white-owned businesses. I don't want them to have that gray area and figure out how they can get through all of this. That's make this tight, watertight. I don't want them to figure out how to go through these tracks. For example, they should not. So when you bid in a contract and you're getting these preference points and it starts to add up and you got these five time generation companies who can afford that margin. So if it's 10, 15 percent, oh, we can afford the margin because they got money like that. So don't let them have, don't let them add on to their preference points by putting on subcontractors that's gonna lessen that margin. It's very important that we have a gap in a margin when we bend against these prime contractors. More than 5%, 5% ain't gonna get it. 10% ain't gonna get it. 15% maybe, but we have to have that margin very high enough for us to even win these contracts. Don't, and I applaud everybody, but don't get it twisted. It, once once these uh, 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 white-owned contractors figure it out and figure out how to get past that margin gap, then this, this is not gonna work. We gotta keep this water tight, everybody. And that gap has to be substantial, like 20%. They should not be allowed to have, to bring their preference points up only to a certain, it should be a cap. And then the minority contractor should have that gap 20% or more to win that contract. If it's a hundred, it's a million dollar contract, which obviously we all have problems uh, 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 getting, um, being able to uh, bid that contract because our, 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 our surety. But for example, if you use a million dollars and the gap is 20%, which is now our bid goes down to 800,000, then that's the kind of gap we need. That 5% ain't going to get it. 10%, 100,000 ain't going to get it. We got to make you, sure Stanley. it's watertight. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for that, Stanley. And I know we've had several conversations. Uh, as Jason mentioned, we have the Supporting Contracting Opportunities Committee that is forming, and uh, I, I think you've been uh, keyed in there. And then we want to make sure that all others on the line who have similar thoughts, perspectives on what will work, what won't work, et cetera, that we can tap into that. Um, not just now, not just through the survey, but on a continual basis. I saw a question on the line that asked how we were going to monitor the success of these race neutral uh, strategies on a monthly basis. And that's an excellent question because that's one of the things that is intended by what we're, uh, what we're putting forward is that we have a recurring dashboard where we are able to see the progress on a regular basis and not wait two years to figure out what happened two years ago. And so that's a critical part of this process we are working on it. We've already started in conversations with the city administration on how to build that, structure it so that we can uh, make sure that we have that visibility. And I see yeah, a comment about report cards. I'm gonna call on Cheryl Suddeth, whose, hands I, whose hand I see raised. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself and provide your comment. So, um, good morning. I'm, I'm gonna say this from the other side. As somebody who's been doing procurement and contracting and compliance for over 25 years, let me just say on the other side, it's very, very important that we recognize that DBE, MWBE, SBE, SLEB contracts, minority means minority. It doesn't mean black business. So you have to know the rules, right? And what these other companies know is they know the rules. They know the loopholes, they know the rules. So they will go out and they will get 
some people to sit in and say, I'm part of this company, if it's one or two or three people to sign their names and say that they are a, they are a black or, or Latino or, or Asian American person who is a person who is part of their company so that they can go out and get these contracts. What I'm imploring black businesses to do is know the rules. Know the rules, know how to respond to these RFPs, know how to respond to these IFBs and these RFIs, know how to put your paperwork in on time, dot your eyes, cross your teeth, so that you can get these contracts. It's more than just racism and discrimination because that's not going to go away. You saw that with, with Prop 16 not passing. You see that we are not going to get this unless you band together and you get these, these solicitations in. The other thing I will tell you before I leave you is you've got to get more people on the other side of the, of the process. You need more people like me who are on the other side making the decisions for who is gonna get these contracts. It doesn't matter how tight your RFP is, how tight your documentation is, if the people who are making the decisions for the administration and these cities and these in these companies are still going to put their finger on the scale for these same companies. The last thing I will tell you is this. It is no discrimination if the same companies keep getting the jobs, they are getting the experience. And the experience becomes the, the, the weighted qualifier. So that's not the discriminatory factor. It's just that if I have the experience and you never get an opportunity to get the experience, it becomes a a, a catch 22, because you never get the experience, you never get to put it on your resume, you never get to put it on your dossier. So you never get to have that 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 ability to show that you can do the job. And if you never get the, the ability to show you can do the job, you never get to put it in your, in your documentation. So you have to find a way to break that cycle. And the only way you can find a way to break that cycle is we need more people, black, Latino, indigenous people on this side doing the procurement. I'm gonna be working with Ms. Kathy Adams, we already talked about it, so that we can get this experience and we can know these rules. You gotta know them, you gotta dot the I's and cross the T's. You can't just keep talking about it. Do the work, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Cheryl. I've seen a lot of comments just uh, and, you know, lifting up your and uh, acknowledging how right you are. And you are absolutely critical uh, perspective that we cannot just create opportunities open the door but we need to be able to support our people to actually be ready to navigate this and encounter those things that we're not going to be able to get rid of this institutional racism is real we can't just pretend like it's going to go immediate away immediately um i'm grateful for you the work you're doing on your end in procurement the folks we have in the city for what they're doing and uh the commitment that i have seen from our city administrator to really uh make sure that we do have folks on the other side that have the goal, have the expectation, and also, as we said, the transparency with the report card uh, that you know they know that they're going to be expected to do that as well. Next in the queue, I see Alicia Kidd. Alicia, I'm uh, asking you to unmute so you can have your question or comment. Yes, hi, my name is Alicia Kidd and I'm a native born Oaklander, born and raised third generation. I am an entrepreneur as well as a member of the um, African-American Chamber, um, Black Chamber and the Oakland Metropolitan Chamber. And I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Cheryl just said. On the other hand, I agree a lot of what she's saying, but there is racism, no matter how much in, in concurrence to what Stanley said, because I've known him for years, we can have our I's and dot our T's, but it's still that racism. You can have everything. So I do agree with a lot of points that she's saying. The Black Chambers have been here for years, but we have to recognize there is redlining, there's discrimination. If white businesses can go and cherry pick and get me to be a business partner just to fill that quota, that is discrimination. So we cannot no matter how many, yes, we need to be on the procurement side, but there, I'm not gonna discount that there are not black owned businesses who go for contracting that don't have their I's dotted and their T's crossed. There is a level of discrimination that takes place. And we have to address that through policy, 
people in those positions have to look out for black owned businesses and make sure that they're walking us through. Because again, there's people like myself, there's people like Stanley who are in position, but still have to overcome. And it's for these white companies not to get priority, you know? So that's kind of like what I want to say to that. And then to address the Oakland Post um, founder, um, I think another area where our, when it comes to black media, what needs to evolve is technology. Um, we need youth on, on these forms, but we need to have technology to get the word out about black owned businesses, what's going on, get your, 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 your information on Instagram, Snapchat, and that involves the youth. So we have to get this type of information out to the Gen Z and the millennials and the ones coming up. So I think having these conversations are instrumental, but we need to evolve into technology. Like for example, the Black um, Cultural Zone, the Black Arts Business and Movement District. We need to evolve and put this type of conversation needs to be on YouTube. And then there needs to be people like myself and younger than me evolving and getting that technology out there and stop doing things so traditional. So I will just say in closing, discrimination still does exist with black owned businesses. And I am in a business, I'm in the wine industry. Funding, it's a lot of discrimination and I'm actually licensed in five different areas through ABC and the trade commission. So I'm the one that dots my I's and cross my T's and still gets discriminated against on the procurement side and on the person that has it. So we got to address discrimination. We have to hit the root of the problem. We have to also involve more youth, have more programs that preach entrepreneurship and black owned businesses be able to intern and bring in the black youth. And then finally involving technology to get the word out. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for, so much for your words, your passion, uh, Alicia. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we have some other questions in the chat. Uh, let's see, Pam or Lena from my team, can you- Excuse me, Council Member yes. Lauren Taylor. Uh, Please, given that you. we're over time, can we just ask to extend? I think the meeting is important and I know everybody is busy, but I think that if we could just ask everybody to hang on for like the next you know, 10 minutes to respect the time, and finally, I just want to say, which I didn't get an opportunity to say, everything that you're saying here, the chamber has been at the table with Deborah Barnes, Jason Mitchell, uh, the chief of staff, the mayor's office. And while everything that we're saying is critical right now, I'm just asking everybody who showed up this morning to give us an opportunity. We're at the table. I know what has happened in the past. I know where the dead bodies are. I know where the pain is, but I'm asking you guys, you show up next week on Tuesday, because this is why we're here. It's not a one shoe fits all. So I get you, but part of the disparities is we know what the problem is. We're moving forward. We've not forgotten. Systemic racism is real, but I'm begging each of you, give us a chance. The chamber is not at the table just to be listening. We're about results. We were on the front end to help get the disparity study released. The mayor personally convened this group. That's a start. It doesn't matter how critical of what people haven't done, it's now. So I'm asking you guys, help us move forward. We know where the pain is, but help us move forward. Thank you for that, Kathy, and for your partnership. Mm -hmm. And thank you for uh, helping keep us focused on time. We are uh, 10 minutes over. For those who may need to leave early, I do wanna uh, just answer the question around how you can get involved, how you can uh, stay plugged in. So please reach out to my office, uh, district numeral six, district six at oaklandca.gov. We will absolutely make sure that you're plugged in. The news, the, uh, the sorry, the survey is how we are aggregating information from those uh, businesses and making sure that you are plugged in to uh, the city's processes, but then also we will be forming a distribution list to stay uh, plugged in and uh, keep you informed as well. Uh, in addition to that, we do have this Tuesday on the 16th, we will be uh, hearing the second reading of the ordinance. That second reading, uh, the meeting begins at 1.30 p.m. We will make sure that you, uh, those who are have registered for this 
event this town hall, get that information in your email as well. That being said, I do want to just ask if those who are able to stick around, we do so for another 10 minutes as uh, Ms. Adams suggested, uh, and we will hear other questions, also follow up. And just want to put a point in, thank you, Kathy, for your leadership, the Oakland African American Chamber, all the work you're doing to make sure we get beyond talk, beyond questions, to actually moving forward. It's uh, a privilege to partner with you and others on that. Next in the queue, I see uh, Cheney Turner. Cheney, I'm asking you to unmute so you can make your comment or question. All right, I'm unmuted now. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Councilman Taylor, for bringing this together. Just wanted to um, kind of echo what Ryan was saying. Actually, <laughs> said a lot of what I was going to say in regards to um, making sure that youth are involved in these conversations. Um, Better man. Oh, the youth are the future. Um, I am gender non-binary for whoever was asking. Um, um, involving more youth into these conversations and going into the schools. Um, I think we have to start with financial literacy um, uh, in the schools and training our youth on how to actually um, uh, start a business as someone who's an Oakland native uh, from East Oakland who has, you know, started businesses. I probably would have been able to been more successful and scaled if those tools and certain resources were uh, were available um, uh, to me um, at at a uh, at a younger age. Um, the digital divide is real. The class divide is real. Um, I would like to see more uh, opportunities of training for our houseless um, people, especially here in District Seven. You know, um, uh, in Six, when we're talking about reimagining. Um, a new economy and what Oakland will look like in a workforce, it should be inclusive of all people, but starting with our most marginalized people, which are, you know, our, um, our houseless people on the street. We have many of uh, vacancies here along East 14th that could be used uh, for job training facilities. Yes, somebody dropped youth uprising and others. We have ELYDC here um, as well. And so I just wanted to point out that we need more, um, more digital training. Um, also, you know, including our youth, someone had mentioned AOL. No one uses that. If people want to get in contact with you, you have to have um, a technology that is um, successful, that is accessible uh, for everyone. So I just wanted to point out like more youth, teenagers uh, involved in leading these conversations and having their voices censored. Thanks. Thank you for that, Cheney. And you mentioned uh, the opportunities for our youth and workforce development, those opportunities. I do want to just give a shout out to a few of those who uh, I know are doing incredible work. I want to acknowledge Cypress Mandela Training Center based in District 6, doing incredible work uh, training our youth. Uh, Construction Resource Center, um, the, the work that they're doing as well, West Oakland Job Resource Center, the uh, so even the social enterprises that are uh, offered by Roots Community Health Clinic the, uh, the, as a way of training for job skills development. I know there are many others that I'm not able to list. I also wanted to lift up our black developers who are um, pick. bringing opportunities as well. Pardon me, Paul? The pick. The pick, absolutely. The, the pick, uh, it, <laughs> yes, thank you. The Oakland uh, pick, absolutely need to acknowledge the work that they are doing as well. Um, our Black developers, we've got CHDC with Donald Gilmore, we've got Suda, Alan Dones, we've got uh, Oakland and the World with uh, our own Elaine Brown, and then we also have uh, others, uh, I know Michael Johnson and, and other developers, uh, Leon Gilmore with the Steps and Ladders program. And so I want to just acknowledge that there are people on the ground doing the work, and we need to continue to lift up their efforts as well. Um, and I apologize for anybody I didn't mention because I'm sure I'm going to hear about it. Next in the queue, Frank Tucker asking you to unmute and uh, make your comments or question. Frank Tucker, are you there? Yeah, I was just trying to uh, unmute. Since I run a company called Tucker Technology, I had to figure the technology out here. 
Uh, you know, uh, my points are uh, extremely brief, but based on a lot of experience, as well as seeing a variety of these disparity reports <clears throat> and a variety from Oakland, which time and again come up with the same results, that we're uh, giving a disproportionate amount of the uh, contracts relative to our availability. The first thing I think would make the biggest difference is if we gave the contract compliance department some teeth. If when Deborah Bonds sees that our certified small local disadvantaged businesses aren't being given our fair share and aren't being uh, awarded contracts, particularly in the area that Dr. Ramsey showed that don't even go to bid, which isn't in the public where the managers make those decisions. If that, con if that department had teeth, and now can go to the council, could go to the very departments and say, we have a problem here. Let's not give this award until that problem is remedied. The second remedy that I'm looking at is employee valuations of the managers, of the people in the city who let the contracts, of the people in the city who are really spending our tax dollars. If their employee valuations, if their bonuses, if their chance for promotion, if their job performance was based on contract compliance, which now would mean we're given our fair share relative to our availability, I guarantee you we wouldn't be spending our time having a forum like this which we've had for the 25 years that I've been in business in Oakland. Instead, we'd be having a forum talking about what more can we do for our city by recirculating the dollars in our own community. And that's it, thank you. Thank you for that, Frank. Um, I know you've got a lot of uh, experience and perspective in the different boards you've served on and then also leading your, your business here. Um, next in the queue, uh, I think we've got I see Doug, your hand, but I'm going to go to someone we haven't heard from before coming back to you. I see Keisha Henderson. Keisha, I'm asking you to unmute so that you can make your comment or ask the question. Keisha, I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, this is Janelle. I'm oh. sorry, Keisha, I wasn't invited to this. And so Keisha forwarded me the email. Um, and this is Janelle. So thank you, Councilman Taylor. Um, you know, I just want to say that this meeting um, is very refreshing. And I was not aware that there are so many others that are involved in these processes in the city. Um, I'm a former police commissioner, but I am a D7. Um, I live in D7 and um, I just didn't know all of this. And so I feel like the information is not being shared. And I was a police commissioner for three years and everything that has been said here today, I have been echoing. When I was a police commissioner, I was echoing and it fell on deaf ears, but anyway, Again, this is very refreshing and I feel like we need to have a platform of this sort to exchange information and see what's out there. Who are the black business owners? Where can I spend my black dollars in black businesses? Um, how can I assist in helping? You know, that culture zone, we need more information about that. How can I help spread the word? Because this right here is what we need. And so I would encourage this group or whoever put this on, Councilman Taylor, to continue to do so quarterly, monthly, something, because I did not know that all of this existed. So thank you to everybody who was on this platform. And thank you, everybody who's commenting and just giving information. It's so helpful. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Janelle. Um, I see Kathy nodding in agreement. And one of the things that we talked about when we were planning this specific event was that we can't just have a one and done event. It's about the con continuity. It's about keeping the momentum going. So we will be following up relative to next steps and how we move forward on that. Uh, next in the queue, I see David Peters. David, I'm asking you to unmute. You should be able to do so now. Thank you, Councilman Taylor. I appreciate the opportunity to 
to comment in this forum. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask kind of a narrow question about the study that I didn't understand, and then I had a, a broader comment. Uh, my question about the study, as someone as a professional service provider, um, accountant, CPA type. Um, when I read the study, I couldn't tell if the only professional services studied were the architectural and engineering services and other services related to construction contracts, or if more broadly, all uh, professional services were included, including you know financial type services that our firm provides. So that's a question. If, if, if you want, um, we can have Dr. Ramsey answer that question, but go ahead and just finish your, your statement as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I heard a brother before me make a comment I was going to make about including in the valuation of managers who let no bid contracts. Uh, part of their evaluation is the assessment of the racial distribution of those of, of those contracts. I think that's that's critical, critical. Um, and to tie that back to evaluation and performance, um, as well as that 360 degree view. Uh, my, my observation is at the, at the council level. And so I've noticed, and I, and I was on a call, so I've missed some of this, you may have addressed that. I've noticed recently, both urban core, urban core being the public commenters with glee around the fact that urban core was having difficulty assembling all of their equity financing. We know that black folks are subject to systemic and institutional disparities in access to capital. And so to see that being targeted at a public level um, infuriated me to be frank. Um, and I'm, the city should be, and as a council, should be looking at the awarding of these development contracts through an affirmative lens. I think we've got a study that requires and calls for affirmative actions taken to, to lessen these disparities. And we, I saw the same thing in Oakland in the world several times previously in the delays on contracts that staff had recommended were being sidetracked at the council level. And so I wanna make sure um, that, that you're able to align and that we provide you the support uh, to roll up and align the rest of the council members to have a, an explicit racial focus. Because I know what we've heard from Director Flynn uh, in connection with addressing the racial disparities in the racial disparity study, that we cannot correct these disparities unless we mention race. And so let's be clear and explicit about the mentioning of race so that we can call out the disparities so that we can address and begin to mitigate them. Because we've been here for too long to continue to go through the same things. And so we see Councils change, this is nothing personal. We see councils change, but the systems behind them continue to yield the same results of disinvestment that have always existed here in Blackwood. So thanks for letting me talk. Thank you for that, David. Um, I am absolutely not here to just perpetuate the same old and see the same issues come back again two years, four years, 20 years later. So 100% committed there. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ramsey and give you a chance to just respond to the specific question. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the analysis of professional services included not only design services, architectural and engineering, but all other services where there was a specialized certificate or, or a training required. So it was a broad definition of that. And I'd like to take the moment since you've given me the mic uh, to also make reference to this concern that we have. And I think it's a legitimate concern that you always have to be qualified. But we must recognize that our study analyzed the efforts of very mature businesses that have been in business since the length that Frank Tucker represents and others. And so it is not a matter of not having your eyes dotted. So let us not get... We should be very focused on that fact. And additionally, recognize that the majority, 90% of the contracts awarded are under 250,000. You do not need a lot of dots on your eye to do contracts at 250 or 50,000. So yes, it is systemic, it's broad-based, and it will change only if it's mandated. And so I just want to ask all of us to just keep focused that new, young, older, mature, you are locked out as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Ramsey. I also see in the queue, Amber Blackwell. Amber, I'm uh, asking you to unmute so that you can make your comment or ask your question. Hi, everyone. I'm Amber. And um, 
third generation Oaklander. And I wanted to just let everybody know that this is the year for redistricting. And there will be outreach coming to the community to be able to have input on how the new district lines will be um, drawn. This is the first year that they have ever had a resident led uh, commission. So this is the redistricting commission. And this is the first year that they have ever had residents from Oakland on this redistricting commission. And lots of interesting things are coming up as a group uh, trying to figure out uh, a more equitable way because it has not been so in the past. And everything that we're talking about on this call is directly tied to redistricting. So when that announcement comes out, Please participate. Uh, District 3, District 6, District 7. Yeah, it's imperative that we be at the table. So I just wanted to make that announcement that the redistricting is coming. Pay attention. It's important. Thank you. Thank you for that, Amber. Um, a, a critically important uh, public service announcement there. Next, I see Ray Bobbitt. Actually, you know, before we go to Ray, I saw a comment from, uh, to me from Eddie Dillard. Ed uh, Dillard, if you are uh, there, I'm going to ask you to unmute so that you can make a comment. Again, I know we're over time. So those, I think there are three remaining hands want, want to call on you guys, but please uh, keep it brief so that we can close out and uh, give folks the rest of their day back. Eddie. Council Member Taylor, this is Ed Dillard. I want to say thank you uh, for leading this effort and thank you to Council Member Kaplan and uh, Treva and uh, Phi for weighing in on this very important activity. We really need to make some structural changes, not superficial changes, some structural changes. The process by which the city does business has to change. We can't just tinker at the margins. We have to do things differently. We have to make sure that each department that advertises contracts, advertise them with the Post newspaper in the Black community so that contractors and business people are aware of the opportunities and make those opportunities available in a timely manner. We just can't do things the same as we have been doing. And this effort, thanks to Dr. Ramsey for exposing what we all has, have known for decades and Having this information is great, but putting things in place that actually guarantees that we, we as Black people have an opportunity to participate. I agree with Frank Tucker 100%. We have been in this environment. We know the things that they have uh, systematically done to exclude us, and now we have to play a different game. We have to be engaged. We have to be knowledgeable. We have to participate. We have to grow Black businesses. Black businesses hire Black people. So if we want to ensure that Oakland is vibrant, that Oakland has a base that can grow and cherish our opportunity, we have to do things differently. Thank you. Thank you for that, Eddie. And uh, to, to your point about the advertising, getting the word out, uh, one of the points in the resolution we passed in January is, uh, actually, no, I take that back. It's in the resolution, in the ordinance that's coming this Tuesday. It is ensuring that anybody who contracts with the city, that upon executing that contract, they need to publicize the opportunities that will be coming forward uh, as a developer or as a prime subcontractor, as opposed to, uh, waiting until two months, two weeks before you have to hire someone and then saying you couldn't find anybody. So absolutely right. We need to change structurally how we do things. I see three final hands, Ray Bobbitt, Diane Lewis, and Stanley Cooper. And then we're gonna close out today. 
Um, so Ray, go ahead. You're up next. Hi, thank you, uh, Council Member Taylor. Uh, for, I, I actually had uh, lowered my hand, but I'll just take this opportunity to uh, say thank you uh, to yourself, uh, to Council Member Reed, to Vice Mayor Kaplan, and to Council Member Fife for uh, you know weighing in on this this subject, uh, to Dr. Cobb as well as Kathy Adams. Uh, this has been a great vehicle and a great uh, vehicle to get understanding as a uh, in, leading a vision that's trying to redevelop the Coliseum. Uh, this has been a, a great experience to know that this information exists. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Ramsey, for all the research and the work that you've done. At the end of the day, um, you know, I was born and raised in East Oakland, educated through Oakland Public Schools, and have led a company uh, that's been based in District 7 for 23 years. And so I'm very excited to continue this process and knowing that there's a vehicle in place to support African-American leadership and vision is something that's I'm very grateful for. So I lowered my hand after I heard uh, Kathy Adams speak with respect to how this is not gonna be a, a, a one and done. It's gonna be a vehicle. It's gonna be an opportunity to move forward. Uh, I think we all need that. And as somebody who's met with over 21 community-based organizations in the last several months, um, including the Black Cultural Zone uh, and the African American Chamber of Commerce uh, and, and many others. Um, I'm very, very excited to know that there's a center point that can all intersect and this conversation uh, becomes the starting point for that vehicle. So I just wanted to thank you guys very much for taking the time to put this together to promote this information so that as you go through and navigate through this process, you know that there's this, a vehicle of support for you. So thank you very much. Thank you for that, Ray. Uh, next, Diane Lewis, I'm asking you to unmute. Go ahead and uh, make your comment or question. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been, I've been blessed all day, the last couple of hours listening in, but I just wanted to offer, um, I'm Oakland born and raised myself, and I do care, cared enough to actually be the career liaison for Alameda County and Oakland Unified doing health fair, I'm sorry, health fairs, doing job fairs and talking to business owners about giving youth a shot. But I also had the benefit of working at Main Street Lunch where we had entrepreneur and residence programs. So the cross section of actually having the time now during COVID, this distance learning could be an opportunity in my view to actually get some of these programs off the ground, if they were resourced, to literally engage youth in what they want to do with their career and how they want to start their own business. And I just wanted to add that, that there is a huge opportunity now for young people to be engaged in learning business and getting the education to them. We just need the resources. And there is so much talent in Oakland. I've seen it in my own. It's just an opportunity right now for all of these things to converge. And I'm excited to be a part of it. So thank you today for having this forum. It's excellent. Great, thank you so much, Diane. Last in the queue is Stanley Stanley Cooper. If you're, a, I, know, I think we may have heard from you. If you, did you have something else to add? Well, we heard from Stanley. That's our member. Let's be respectful of okay. others. So, Thank you, so Stanley. Heard, so it looks like we've heard from everybody whose hand is still raised. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question or make a comment, uh, you can do so by emailing us at district6 at oaklandca.gov. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up note to those who registered, just thanking you for joining and uh, uh, detailing additional ways to get involved. I want to, again, thank those who helped to make this happen. Kathy Adams with the Oakland African American Chamber. Of course, our Dr. Eleanor Ramsey with Mason Tillman for all the work you've done leading up to this and that you are committed to continuing to do. Uh, thank you, Paul Cobb for co-hosting along with the Oakland Post, my council member colleagues for your continued uh, partnership and support as we move forward on these efforts and everyone else for joining today. This is a critical conversation. It is not one and done. We will continue the momentum. Thank you and have a good rest of your day. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, I am going to take a, a moment to say happy birthday to my wife, whose birthday is tomorrow, Valentine's Day oh. as well. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. All right. Bye.
Bye-bye. Everyone be safe.